It's nice to be here. It's been a good weekend with a lot of great talks, many of which I think I'll, I've learned a lot from, and I'll use a lot of what I've learned. So I'm happy just to have been here, even if this talk will be a total disaster. So we'll see. <clears throat> so my name's Leo, but uh, on the internet I'm known as Sir Ifslot, even in certain games. In case you see that name, then you know it's, maybe it's probably me. The realm of too many options. <clears throat> I'd just like to start out to say to Nils, uh, thank you for the invite. It's very nice of you. And uh, yeah, it's fun to be here. <clears throat> it's really extraordinary the amount of uh, technology and the sheer aid that we've had from the free software movement. Uh, it's, it's, I really feel as if I'm in the presence of giants. <laughs> A lot of people here uh, have helped me get to where I am you know, today. So for that, I thank you, all of the programmers. Uh, Felipe and his KX Studio, I use that all the time. So big thanks to him. And I, yeah. <laughs> ah. you, 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 beat me, you beat me to it because I was going to ask all of you to give yourself a good round of applause because we've all done incredible work in all of our uh, respective fields. So big round of applause to everyone in the room. I <laughs> but this talk will also be a sort of a cautionary tale as you can see, of both great gratitude and confusion, because when I started out with uh, GNU Linux and all that stuff, uh, I was 16, 17, and Ardor was still in version 2. Uh, and, you know, s s sessions would crash, and some sessions I, I lost, and I couldn't get them back working properly, so I lost some riffs. I was able to save them, but, you know, back then it was a lot of work. Nowadays, Ardour uh, and all of the other software that went along with it works without a hitch, at least for me. It doesn't crash anymore, so that's great, you know. So it's come a long way. But, uh, you know, what follows with a lot of options is a lot of... There's a lot of baggage. We've seen some of that, uh, I mean, this weekend alone, uh, with conflicting programs and platforms and formats and all the rest of it, disagreements on the workflows and general approaches to things. And... I'm just an end user, I, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a, I have no idea what's going on, mostly in the machine. So for the end user, it's, we, we just want to know, you know, what works best and what works. You know, that's what we want to know. And so the, for the mortal end user, such as me, it was very bewildering at 16, 17, and the IRC chat rooms were very helpful, so I'm thankful for that too. A lot of people in this room actually helped me get things going, so thank you again. But for the poor suckers starting out, it's really exhausting when you have no idea about Linux and all the rest of it. <clears throat> so, with that out of the way, uh, I'm a big fan of Brian Eno. I don't know, does anybody here know Brian Eno? Is the name? Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's good. He's given a lot of lectures, and one of them that really made an impression on me was when he was talking about the... I'm going to play devil's advocate here and, and uh, talk about the limits of, of, of computers. They were sold to us, in the realm of music anyway, on the foundation of a lie in a way, which was they said that, you know, with computers you can do anything. It sounds great, you know, you could do anything with computers. The limits are endless. You could, and it's, it's cool, it's good. But the problem with limitless possibility is that you no longer have a framework for, well, what are the current cultural limits of what's possible? I see it this way as with the guitar, for instance, that's what you have. And currently you have an idea of what can be done and what can't be done. And suddenly shows up, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix, and then he does something completely new that wasn't thought of, or Van Halen. So he, they revolutionized uh, the limits. They expanded the limits. Whereas, you know, limits, limitless technology like the computer with synths and all the rest of it, makes it difficult to feel that you've, you've actually done something new a lot of the time, at least for me. So, you know, limits set the parameters for what can be new a lot of the time, as opposed to limitless infinity. And that will be a key part of this talk. So, uh, with that out of the way, I'll just do some shameless advertising. Uh, <laughs> I've already done some, I'm serifs a lot. But I'm going to play you a track, and I think it's important to play the whole thing. So you'll hear some of the elements, 
and some of the things I'm going to talk about. So I'm just going to play it. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to close this. And hopefully it will close. Yeah, it's closing. <laughs> ah. Let's see. So this song is called White Man's Blues. I finished it a few months ago. And I hope you enjoy it. <clears throat>
Hello? Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, that's a humble demonstration of what can be done with, with very little equipment. And this is the hardware that I used. And really, that was pretty much all of it. Hardware. <laughs> and those two, this, I made this in Sweden in my previous school. They were nice enough to come in one day and they just sort of did a few things. Most of it was terrible, but the trouble, trouble thing that I told them to do worked out pretty well. So it's this sound card, you know, and this laptop, my guitar, that microphone, mixed it on those speakers, this computer, and that bass, and that was it. <clears throat> and the rest was with hydrogen. Sorry that it wasn't in, in drum gizmo. I'll, uh, next time. <clears throat> so, I mean, I'll open the session later, but uh, I mean, or I could do it now. It's 85 tracks, which is my <laughs> biggest production to date. Uh, could probably have been less, uh, but at the time that's what it was. <clears throat> oh, what's going on? Oh, yeah, it gets in front. <clears throat> One thing I wanted to talk about the, the slide guitars and everything I'll get into if we have time. Uh, I just wanted to get into how you actually work because a lot of people were curious about my workflow and how I do things. I have an attitude towards things. The screams, for instance, it, things are only out of place when they're out of place, but they can be fixed. Is I, if you if you solo well, when this if this ever loads up, uh, <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> there are certain things that when you solo them, it just sounds ridiculous. It just doesn't. I mean, it sounds really strange, but in the right context, it actually works. So you have to trust that your voice isn't necessarily bad, even if you hear soloed. Uh, I don't know, Iron Maiden tracks, for instance. If you just hear the solo vocals, it, it just sounds awful or ridiculous. There's something about the combination. So I'll be so bold as to just solo that part so you can hear what it sounds like. I mean, it sounds okay, but it's, it's the whole spectrum that actually... <laughs> It's completely different. <clears throat> so I think a lot of people do themselves a lot of, uh, well, they do themselves injustice and a lot of bad favors by not trusting that their performances are, are okay. Just trust that the mixing is a huge part of it and the live thing is, a, an, is another thing. So find a solid sound to begin with and then stick with it. That makes for, for easier mixing as well. If you stick with it, it makes it easier once you get to the mixing stage if you have a sound that's already pretty, you know, that you like. So a lot of people ask me what I use for the guitars. I invariably, I always use a 412 cabinet plus another one, which is usually a Vitalize AC30 style or A2 style cabinet. I also use the Guitarx DMX distortion a lot for the vocals, the bass, the guitars, mostly always. And another thing that I didn't know was that I was having trouble getting it to sound right. And somebody in I IRC, they tipped me about mixing in mono, because when it's in stereo, it sounds very neat and all the rest of it, but there's still elements that are struggling for sonic space. So they told me, just, just put it in mono on the master bus, and then mix in mono, and make sure that you can hear all the elements. And that really helped, because once I put it back into stereo, it was like, that solved all the problems which once you get to the hi-fi speakers where you really hear a lot of the stuff. So that was a huge help. So methods of working, if you have, these are some of the secrets that I'll be, because you've been so kind and given me a lot of your, your stuff, I'm going to give you all that I have. Uh, if you have lack of content or ideas, <clears throat> A lot of people, uh, somebody noticed that, you know, this melody that you had sounded pretty similar to this. And, and they were right, because what I did was I played the song backwards once, not with this one, but another one that I'll show you. I played it backwards, and it's in the same key. So then you get a lot of new melody ideas. And so I, I basically stole content for myself. And then, you know, <laughs> so I'm going to give you a short example of that. <clears throat> which can be very helpful if you're lacking in, in material. It's, it's very, very helpful. Uh, this is a song that hasn't been finished yet, but uh, I'll just go ahead anyway. As you pull for it, it's a push from you. A 
at that point, I hadn't got much further. And so what I did was I just kind of... And I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And so later... same melody and it really works yeah so <clears throat> and this is also in part because I studied Mozart for a while and if anybody's curious about how you do that with muse score or whatever you can flip and invert your notes so that's really helpful too for the really technical person that's something else you could do really helpful tool another one is just play it in a different pitch if you're just sort of stuck with it or whatever I always do that. I play it in a different pitch and that's, of course, if you do it directly with a wheel in, in our door, it's going to make it faster or slower. But that could be interesting, too. Disclaimer, though, don't mix while pitch shifting. <laughs> Probably obvious to a lot of you, but somebody actually did this when I told them. And they said, I don't understand. My mix sounded so much better. And now it sounds weird. And I said, well, did you mix it while you were pitch shifting? And I said, yeah, it sounded great. Well, I mean, it changes the sonic atmosphere completely so you shouldn't be mixing when you're pitch shifting it's an obvious thing but you know in case and in terms of how you work when, when you're getting close to uh, not a finish but a sketch or something like that a, a lot of people wondered how I feel get to the feel get to feel that it's ready and I play unfinished uh, material in weird settings so I play it in public so if you know somebody owns a pub or a cafe or something like that and he's really kind and kind of listens to it in advance to make sure it isn't complete crap, he just allowed me to plug the thing to sit in a real setting. So you're sitting kind of in a room like this with the speakers in a real room with real people talking. And it's just fun to sit there if they don't realize it's you doing the DJing, to sit there and just sort of watch how people react. Because as soon as you play it in front of people, you have to think in terms of, well, this is how it's going to go out to people when they hear it. So it completely changes your attitude, which is a huge help. And also, you know, play it to people you care about. Just sit next to them, and that makes it really awkward immediately because it's not finished. And immediately you're, you're, you're drawn away from this comfortable setting of in your room alone and all the rest of it with headphones or whatever. So that's another thing. And just listen to it from another room is something else that I do. I just, you know, crank it up a little more and then I close the door and I go outside and I listen to it. And if you, could, if you find yourself sort of bobbing your head to the bass frequencies, it's a good sign. But if you're just cringing at it and then sort of going, ah, it's not really, you know, then you know what's, what's wrong. You, you're, you're on the way. And I made this up yesterday. The phrase needs some work, but the... The spirit is there. It's like, detail comes when detail hums. For hours on end is another dead end. What I mean by detail comes when detail hums is like when, I mean, details are important. The devil's in the detail, I think. But in terms of detail, when you hear it humming in your head, that's when you should be working on it. But if you're still recording it or whatever, you shouldn't be spending too much time on, on the details because uh, a lot of directors that I've spoken to, and even the Steven Spielberg who made Jaws, he said that the worst uh, film experience that he ever had was working on Jaws because it took forever to, to get into the cutting room. I mean, the shark wouldn't work and the shark couldn't swim or it sank. I mean, for three weeks they just had to spend three weeks getting it from the bottom of the ocean. And so that was the death of the, the objective perspective of it because he said he had to get into the editing room before he, he knew what kind of movie he had. And so the quicker you work, for me anyway, the better I work. And so a lot of people ask me, how quickly do I work? And the answer to that is as quickly as possible, uh, most of the time. Uh, depends what kind of genre you're doing too, I guess. But And then there's a method of finishing. Uh, this is go getting back to Brian Eno a little bit. It's like, how do you really know when a piece is finished? And he said, well, the only thing is really a deadline. You know, makes sense in a way because... That's the only thing that really puts a fine line between the working stage and the finished stage, when, when it has to be out there. So a deadline. So a way I force myself, and a lot of other people force themselves to actually work towards, a more or work more efficiently, is to just tease and promise uh, to friends whom you care about delivering on time to, 
just say in a week, I'll have, you know, I'll have something really great to show you. And that immediately changes your attitude to whatever you're doing. So a lot of people ask me about that. So that's something I always do. I always say that, okay, next week I'm going to show you something really great. So by then it has to be somewhat great. Uh, don't dig your own music constantly. I know a lot of people, uh, when they work with music, they, as soon as they have something that they like, they start listening to it, and they really they walk around the house, they do the dishes to it, or they just listen to it on loop while they're cleaning. And you know, it, it, yeah, it's, it sounds good, but you have to work, work as a musician working on it. So if you're constantly digging it, you lose your, <laughs> your objectivity, and then it's hard to continue working on it. So that's something I never do. I never really loop it and play it over and over just because I really like it. I sort of just, okay, it sounds good. I, I trust my first impression, and I just try to keep going. And I also trust, somebody told me this, is that, you know, Leo, uh, the work that you've been doing for days or weeks or months are the accumulated hours into a few minutes. So you sort of have to trust that that accumulated time is, is still there for people to hear. So others, they want to time notice all the bad stuff on first listen, unless it's, of course, all really bad. And so I have a short example of this. How am I doing for time? Good. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, okay. Cool. So this is a, I had a guest teacher. She was an extraordinary teacher, in, in, and she was also a Linux buff, by the way, which was interesting. And she, uh, <laughs> she was a lyric, uh, lyric uh, instructor of sorts. She had a phenomenal way of analyzing lyrics and helping us. I'll get her name later if anyone's curious. She was, she was a great help, and I really respected her just from the weekend we were working with her in my previous school in, uh, outside of Göteborg. And she assigned us the most ridiculous assignment ever, which was go write a dance band song. I mean, people threw their hands up in the air. They were like, what's the point? We don't get it. And she was like, you, you, you'll see. And so most people there were just one instrument, guitar, and they, she expected them to just sort of make one thing, you know, really quickly. But I really dug in my heels and, and thought, no, I'm going to really, I really wanted to make an impression on her. I really liked her. So I sat, she gave us that assignment at three o'clock in the afternoon, and I sat up all night producing it and writing it and all the rest of it. So this was the result that I presented the next day. And it's in Norwegian, though, <laughs> but uh, the lyrics are translated in English, so... <clears throat> Jeg så henne på stasjonen når jeg parkerte bilen Hennes hår glødet i solen Bygdeistret når vi festet blikk Så satt hun der på festen alene Det var da jeg fikk samlet opp mot det Til å lede vei mot toalettet For hun virka litt for Den samme plassen i samme belysning Eller hvor som helst, det er av ingen betydning Men vi begynte å danse, baby Ja, kvelden den var fin og en dag Det er så fin og en dag Baby, your kingdom of fiend and the 
Yeah, so, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, I mean, before I switch to the next one, I'm, I'm just curious about what attitude did you suspect I had when I wrote this? Does anybody have any premonitions? No, I mean, more in terms of what, in what spirit I wrote it. Pressure. What? Well, yeah, there was pressure. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you. <clears throat> I mean, it was assigned by a guest teacher, and it was kind of a silly thing, and we all sort of mocked it. And I mocked the idea, too. I thought it was ridiculous. What's the point? But I realized that we were extremely limited in time, so we had to work with what we knew, and the cliches that were already there. And, and dance band music is pretty, you know, frowned up, you know, sort of shunned upon as kind of a, you know, jerk water thing to be doing. But as it turned out, I mean, when I played this in the, in the classroom, I, people were ecstatic. It was ridiculous. I, I'd never received such positive feedback before. And, and some of these other things that I've been playing to you, I'd played to them, and they just sort of shrugged and, you know, eh. And when that thing came about, and clothes falling off in the moonlight, I mean, she threw, she, the teacher was in ecstasy. Because, I mean, because she, she thought that I'd gotten it. But what I wanted to, I was kind of trying to mock the genre. That was my, that was my actual intention in a way. And it, it turned into a, a, a classroom classic overnight. People went around humming it and they wondered what I did. And the girl in the, that was doing the choiring thing in the White Man's Blues that you heard before, she came in and did some looping and her pitch is pretty good so it didn't take too long and I just cut it together and that was it. So what the hell? I mean, the end result was frustratingly good. I'd become a victim of my own success. You know, because <laughs> you spend months working on these other things and then you poop out something in less than a 20, <laughs> 24... No, but really, that was it. And so I completely had to rethink my entire axioms, all of them, on my assumptions on what's good and what's not. And I mean, of course, it's, it's bad, but it's, it's bad in a good way or good in a bad way. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> right, so suddenly I realized that, well, maybe, well, limits are good. This is coming back to the, the point, which is that the limits are very helpful. Uh, following the cliches can be very helpful. Um, and, and then knowing the rules and then breaking them, but following them just enough so that people know what's going on. Uh, unless you really want to revolutionize something. So that pissed me off. But I also I had a kind of a mystical experience because I was sitting there in disbelief just looking at these people listening and they were really into it. And they said, you know, now you're really communicating, Leo, and you're really making headway. And it just wasn't what I wanted. I, I, I wanted people to sort of laugh at it and shrug and go, yeah, this is Leo again. No. They just went, oh, this is, this is great. This is some of your best work. <laughs> Fuck. So, uh, yeah, anyway. So closing notes is like fear of the dark. Be, be weary of, of, of too many. I mean, you can sit in the studio for ages. And, and Brian Eno also said that Pro Tools or whatever DAW you're using can be your best friend or your worst enemy. As soon as people really started working hard in, in Pro Tools, the, the musical aspect of it died because the previous talk about automation you know, once you hear that computers are doing most of the things, it, it doesn't charm us. It sounds so unhuman. So automation can help with that. Uh, but of course, you should revel in the dark as well. I mean, the, the unknown is very interesting, but it can also be very dangerous if you don't have any limits, as it were. So uh, make uncomfortable deadlines, like I mentioned. Limit yourself, but allow for expansion if it's necessary. 
play it backwards and in different pitches. Test in crucial situations, you know, the public thing or in front of friends or, or, or people you don't like, people that you... I also noticed that helped too if you're going to play it for people who are really odious and, and, and you know are going to be really honest with you and maybe don't even like you at all. That's a huge help because you, you could probably predict what they're going to say and then you know what, you have, what work is left to be done. And uh, last but not least, uh, mean what you play and play what you mean is, is something that someone told me, obviously. Is like, just, just mean what you play. It's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true, I guess. Clichés are often true because they've been said over and over again. But yeah, play from the heart, I guess. So that's more or less what I had. And uh, yeah, thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> Uh, go ahead. Hey. Um, well, first, thanks for sharing. Um, I think this is very interesting. Um, I, I wanted to get back to the part where you have people listen to your music when it's not finished. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, well, my experience in that regard is a bit different. Okay. Uh, so a lot of people come to me to ask for feedback with their productions. Um, and what I've noticed is that very often they're not so much looking for advice as uh, for approval of what they're doing, being comforted in the, the thinking that what they're doing is going in the right direction. Right. Um, so when I, when I'm, when I feel that I would like to ask people feedback, when I want other people to listen to my tracks, actually my first uh, reaction now is to ask myself, uh, is it because I'm doubting, you know, uh, I'm doubting my process, or is it because I, I actually feel stuck and I just need to know if this could be interesting for anyone else than me? Uh -huh. But uh, truthfully, regardless of the answer to that, que to that question, the music is just what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I like the part where you shouldn't uh, be the sole, well, listen to your music like it's only addressed to you, like, you know, right. have it in repeat. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that feedback thing, I, I think it can be very tricky. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it goes, to, uh, it has to do with, uh, there's that famous line about, would you prefer a doctor that comforts you while you die? Or would you prefer a doctor that just kind of ignores you as he helps you get better? And it, it depends on personality, I guess. I mean, some people love to just show it to people whom they know, he knows, he or she knows that they're just going to be so friendly and just try to boost them up and all the rest of it. And, you know, it's a, it's a personality thing. But for me personally, I, I've been doing this for quite a while, and most of us have, so I think all of us can handle some real critique. But if, if what you're doing is you just want praise, then by all means, go ahead. But this was in, in terms of actually getting some, some feedback that you... Uh, but could you... Was there a question in, in well, there? Or? <laughs> no, I just, I, I just wanted to add to that because that's, that, that's the way I feel. But then, yes, it, it could extend to knowing how you feel about the feedback that you receive because mm. not everybody is good at receiving feedback, actually. No. Well, the way I receive feedback is, is very, I'm very open uh, about it. But I also listen to the context, you know. And, and I also know, make sure that I know the personality of the person and the music, the taste behind where the feedback is coming from. So, I mean, a few prerequisites are important. I mean, you just wouldn't show it to someone you hardly know at all. That might not be said, because you don't know where it's coming from. So that, that's also a disclaimer. You should probably ask for feedback from people whom you know, so you speak the same language, musically and otherwise. Uh, but yeah, it, different strokes for different folks, of course. Yeah. Sure. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I also don't have a question, but uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I want to comment on that example with the dance band song um, right. because I have a similar experience. Uh, there is a book called The Frustrated Songwriter's yeah. uh, Guide or something. Um, yeah, yeah. And the main point it makes over, I don't know, hundreds of pages, uh, don't buy the book, just uh, read the the summary, um, is that you uh, get together with some friends 
it's called a songwriter circle in the book or something, and pick one day where everybody goes off for 12 hours to make 20 songs. Of course, that's ridiculous. You can't uh. do 20 songs, but the point is to go and try. Right. So you, you come up on that day with about, I don't know, five, six, ten songs, mm -hmm. um, and then you meet in the evening to discuss what you've come up with. Uh, two good things about this. You get something done, and you'll be amazed uh, about the results yeah. because you come up with really um, new ideas because you can't stop and think about what you're doing. You just keep doing. Right. And the other thing is because you meet in the evening with uh, people <coughs> who are in the same position, uh, you get an open discussion because they feel they've only done crap. You feel you've only done crap. Mm. So you have an open, open uh, mind to listen to what you've done. I've yeah. come up with some very good uh, song ideas uh, with this process. Great. Um, the difficulty then, of course, is finishing those finishing ideas. It, yeah. <laughs> I hope I've been of some help, at least, uh, yeah. with that. Uh, but yeah, I've had that book on my reading list, actually, yeah. so I could probably bump it up a bit to read it. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bit wordy, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. If we could have a question. You, you're, you're more than welcome. Even if it doesn't directly relate to this, that's cool. Why Sorry? Why hydrogen? Why hydrogen? Bad habits, I guess. Uh, I mean, well, or I was used to it. The workflow of hydrogen was very... That was the thing that was left out of the hydrogen thing that you, that you mentioned. It was, um, you can actually work with separate outputs for each instrument or each sequence or output. So that you root it all, and then you you just have it there, and you can you can play it and work with it as it as it goes along. But it 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 is problematic. I mean, it it does have room for improvement. Let, let's say uh, so. Drum gizmo is a is a looks to be a great help. I will try it and and get into it. I promise. Uh, so maybe next year I'll have a whole thing on, on how I use drum gizmo. Maybe. Yep. Yeah. Um, besides having, you mentioned you having um, unlimited possibilities in right. terms of software and resources, mm -hmm. um, and then you limit yourself, and um, this helps um, actually getting stuff done. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, did you experience um, while in this process? In the end, did you experience anything you want to have? So there, it's not really limitless, but something you said. Okay, now, now I know what um, what I want, and if I only had that tool or that resource or that workflow, uh, is there anything you you that you want to have? Oh yeah, of course. That's what I meant by limit yourself, but be open to extension later. I mean, always there were things that the slide guitar thing I didn't mention that I had some slide guitars in that first song, and. I was going to, just going to limit myself to the hardware that you saw, but I extended the hardware to the use of a pen for the slide guitar thing. That was really what I expanded on. I just used a pen because I was trying to do the wah, 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 wah just with the plucking and you know, bending, and it just wasn't sounding rednecky enough. And so I needed some, something a little bit more rednecky, and so I just did the pen thing. And at that point, that was an expansion, uh, not exactly a computer tech extension, but but the same, I mean, suddenly I add more plugins or I, you know, add a synth or whatever. But in terms of the realm of possibility, I mean, you could have oscillators all over the place and you could have all sorts of plugins and you can tweak and do, you know, with the software and everything. But at the end of the day, you just have to kind of... Uh, yeah, my dad told me that one. He said that uh, painters have to know when to stop painting you know uh, and that's very important is that you at some point some artists are very good at it painters that I've spoken to they know when in their hearts when enough is enough but I've <laughs> I've seen some painters they just layer on layer on layer and it's just that, that you, it's like this thick you know and you can see that they've been doing I don't know 10 revisions on the same piece of cloth or whatever it is canvas thank you and uh, it's uh, so that's the thing, is to try to be, be cool about it. Yeah. yeah, thanks. When you learn school, 
Sorry? Yeah, go ahead, the microphone. Uh, when you were in school and uh, competing or whatever with other uh, students mm. in composing respective uh, pieces of sound uh, of music, right. uh, did you feel any restrictions by using open source hardware, open source so software, uh, <laughs> compared with potentially other uh, persons that uh, do uh, that use uh, commercial ones? It's a good question. I mean. I could probably answer that even better if I actually used the proprietary softwares, but I don't. Uh, but I mean, the, the limits of it are obvious that, that, that we're essentially competing with a proprietary industry, if you want to use the term competing. So we're always in a minority, so far anyway, so we're always compared to the really, the, the pros, and I use the pros only in terms of they actually get money, you know. And so it's always going to be, the standards are going to be slightly higher in some respect. You know, so what, the, the only limits that I noticed or, or limitations with using free software or open source software was that I, I was unable to convey to other people through the use of that technology that it was more than enough because they just didn't understand that it was enough. They, they thought that well, it was this command line thing that you're doing or... It's much easier if you just do it in Pro Tools like this instead of... So, but in terms of actual limits, I have so many options in, in, in open source that I've never actually come across feeling limited by technology. I've never ever come... So, you know, the free software movement has, like I said, done a huge, huge job with that. So, in that respect, never. The, the only limit I've had is when, it, when it's compared to the other stuff that exists. So. Yeah. One more thing. Um, when you're entering, entering the creative zone, when you're mm. starting composing, mm. what is typically the first thing that comes up? The lyrics, the chord progressions, the drum pattern? What is the, typically the first thing that, that's starting the whole process for you? Usually, I, <clears throat> the way I do the lyrics is I read a lot of books, and I always mark the phrases that I like, and I sort of steal phrases or borrow them or rephrase them. So a lot of the time, it's usually a combination of the phrase in the book with a melody. That's usually how, how it starts. But sometimes it could just be a riff. Sometimes it's a drum beat. Sometimes it's a... So it always varies. I mean, and I'm sure it does for everybody in, in a way. Uh, or I'm, I'm, I think so anyway. From what I've heard anyway, people... Try and that's also another thing to try to limit yourself in different ways by starting in different ways and, and, and all the rest of it. So it always varies. But a lot of the times it starts out with a theme that's based on whatever phrase I had. So, yeah, sure. Last question would be cool. Don't be shy. Yeah. Uh, if we have time, we just crossed the. We crossed the barrier. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it's on SoundCloud anyway. So riffs a lot on SoundCloud. So you can. Yeah. Show your show, show your um, information once. All right. Once more. I had trouble finding your SoundCloud. Okay. Well, <laughs> there it is. There's my ugly mug. And, uh, Yes, there it is. I was searching for Sir Riff a lot. Sir, oh yeah, okay, yeah. A lot of people had trouble understanding when I had in slow, in small letters only. So when I did the capitals, they suddenly, oh, now I get what the name is, because they actually bothered reading it. So, yeah. Sir Riffs a lot. Yeah. I should work on doing a logo so that you can easily read it. So next year, oh yeah. All right, yeah. Uh, thank you again for the talk. Thank you so much.